Bangladesh is the land of superlatives. The Himalayan mountains are the highest mountain range in the world. It has two of the world's largest river systems, the Ganges and the Brahmaputra River, and it's the world's most densely populated country. There's 150 million people, a population half the size of the United States, living in an area the size of, of Louisiana, all within an incredibly dynamic natural system where there have been severe historical earthquakes. The main reason that we're here working is to understand the frequency and origin of those earthquakes. Oh my goodness, these sands are cross-bedded. They are. It's right where you've got over-steepening, right. rapid deposition. There's a lot of different disciplines in this project. This, it looks solid. I am the structural geologist, and other people are sedimentologists, river processes, geophysicists, and we pull together various themes and see how we can learn from each other. The starting point of the geologic processes that affect Bangladesh is the collision of India with Asia that produces, of course, the Himalayas. In this scenario, you have a new system that's just started up geologically, the Dauki Fault. This is a major plate boundary which is developing. That is marking the northern border of Bangladesh. The intersection between these two systems can generate huge earthquakes. This area has had big earthquakes in the past. Consequences were dramatic, but not as dramatic as they might be now when a lot of the population lives concentrated in huge cities. Hakka is the capital city. the heart of Bangladesh with overburdened population 16 million, 45,000 per square kilometer. The buildings are mostly brick machinery, non-engineer. The city has grown up very fast like a mushroom with the unplanned design. Dhaka now probably stands in the highest rig cities in the world. People are very concerned about earthquakes and they want to know how they can save their life during earthquakes. south of the border with India. We're looking at some folds. Here you have sediments that were deposited horizontal and they've been folded and tilted so now they're almost vertical. But you usually have faults beneath folds so we're trying to understand those faults. A lot of what we do is hiking around trying to find rocks that we can access. It's a different fault. And then we take measurements using a special geologic compass so we can understand how they've been tilted because the rocks may have been deposited usually flat, horizontal layers, and then photonic forces will fold them. Drake is 147, and the dip is 22 degrees to the south. The plane has a strike. The strike is the direction of a horizontal line on that plane and then has a dip, which is the angle to the vertical. These two numbers allow you to place the plane in 3D space. And dip is uh, 36 degrees. The landscape is all static, nothing moves, but the position and shape of this rock tells you how it deformed. So, if you have a sandstone and you know that the sandstone was deposited horizontally by a river and now you find it 
dipping at 60 degrees, something must have turned this thing on its side. Not exactly sure where the Dowkey fault is, but we have building evidence that it's a buried fault. It doesn't, it's not exposed at the surface. We're just south of the Indian border where there is a two kilometer high plateau that is moving south towards, um, towards Dhaka. Status, this is the reservoir. Yeah. Position. We're trying to find out how fast that is moving to help assess the earthquake risk from this fault. So we've set up a GPS system here. There's a GPS antenna on the roof and that brings down into a recorder down here. So that's actually accurate enough that we can see the strain that's building up um, around, the, around the fall. This is our sensors, seismometer, that pick up the seismic waves. When there is a big checking, this level goes off. Since this is very close to the Dauki Falls, and Dauki Port is a source of major great earthquakes, so we chose this location for installing our seismometer as well as a GPS. This is a portable seismic station, so whenever there is earthquakes, we move this station close to the source of another earthquake. from Jaflong yeah, this station. Yeah. So we have Jaflong station moving uh, to the north at about uh, 30 millimeters a year and it's moving to the east at around 40 millimeters a year. And so the net result is that this station relative to India is moving to the south right. at about uh, six, six, and a half, uh, six and a half millimeter uh, per year. millimeters per year. We were able to actually uh, see about, the tectonic uh, motions that have been taking place. That's how we know the movement of the Shillong Plateau. You can actually physically see the, the motion of the plates with the GPS. And then presumably stations there are some earthquakes which are not felt by human beings. But we have very good results because so far we have detected with the seismometer more than 300 small events uh, in these regions. So this tells that this area is very active, and in future, a large earthquake can occur. Sediment, fine sediment impacts. We're yeah. over the Dauki Fault. Right here, you can see the dips of the rocks are about 30, about 30, 38, 30, degrees. 38 degrees, and the dips increase as we go to the, to the south. The Indian border is very near to it is very important to determine the fault location in order to assess the seismic uh, events. If the fault is located 10-20 kilometers to the south, that means that the source of the earthquakes is more close to the capital city, Dhaka. A well, fundamental fact of seismology is the bigger the fault, the larger is the potential earthquake that it can generate. In the case of the Dauki Fault and the Shillong Anticline, you're talking about a structure at least 300 kilometers long and about 100 kilometers wide. It's a huge structure. So we expect a very large earthquake. The other thing is that the repeat time between large earthquakes can be pretty long. You may forget about it and say, oh, we never had an earthquake, why should we worry? Geology tells you no. There is a fault, is active. We do know of this 1897 earthquake. And the reason you haven't seen any such earthquake during recent history is simply that the repeat times are very long.
We want to understand how the river systems are potentially being influenced by the tectonic deformation. Good morning. Data coming. One way in which we can study that is to go to the sediment record. Using this local drilling technique, the drill team are able to pour down through anywhere from 50 to 100 meters of sediment. We collect those sediments about every five feet, and that's recording the past five to 20,000 years of history. The first thing we want to do is assess the relative size of the sediments because that's telling us the strength of the water flow that transported that material, and the color tells you something about the environment in which the sediments accumulated. It actually is a, a ticker tape, a recorder of Earth's history. We know there was a major change, of course, in the Brahmaputra River by over 100 kilometers when it shifted from flowing through this low-lying Silet Basin into its modern-day course through the Jamuna Valley. Now, this subsiding Silet Basin should be a strong attractor for the river to want to flow into this big depression. But what we think is that there's some complex tectonic deformation that's actually preventing the river from moving through this shallow ground. And if there was an earthquake, it could force the river into that basin. If it were to happen today, it would truly be a catastrophic event. There'd be whole areas of floodplain that would have a 10 kilometer wide river now flowing through that area. And then whole towns along the river would be entirely abandoned. The purpose of our research is to understand what the Earth does. Probably even more important is convincing people that this is something real, that there is a risk, that his offspring can be killed. Where are you going? If we know how the river behaves and how it can shape the landscape, we can have a better plan for land use. And by studying past earthquakes, the magnitudes, the frequency, the time recurrence intervals, we can have safe life during earthquakes. The size of the disaster and the problems that arise to help people are going to be new. So there is an obvious application to what we're learning here, an urgent application.